That whole case was about whether or not the Red Rock, uh, Red Rock wrongfully foreclosed on the property or improperly foreclosed on the property. And the court in the previous case held that Red Rock didn't do it. So now this is just her turning around and uh, filing it again. And in her op opposition, she made it clear that she's simply relying on the false premise that claim preclusion doesn't apply here because the trust was the party beforehand. And we are the party next, or and that Nina Tobin is the party now as an individual. But as the court read, that, that argument doesn't apply because claim preclusion doesn't just apply to the exact parties. It applies to parties and their privies. So Nina Tobin as a trustee for the trust, and Nina Tobin as an individual are privy with each other. They can't, they can't just switch hats and claim and go through the whole process of her. Uh, it doesn't allow. The doctrine of claim preclusion doesn't allow. With that, we rest on that. Unless you're on a rest of questions. Any questions? Uh, folks that um, joined in this motion, does anybody would like to speak before I talk with the uh, plaintiff's attorney? No? Okay. I'd like to speak with plaintiff's attorney then. Good morning, Your Honor. Your Honor, I'm sorry. I missed that. Okay, Mr. Hall? Yeah, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Did, did the court say something? I, I missed that. I just said anybody, I said there's a bunch of joiners in that motion. Does anybody want to speak in support of that motion? Oh, yes, Your Honor. I will. Joseph Hall for the Coast Party. Okay, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Your Honor, what counsel for uh, Red Rock here is correct. The, the team here and the opposition from plaintiff make very clear the singular argument really is that Ms. Tobin was not, individually, was not a party to the previous litigation before Judge Kishner. Well, that's fine and dandy. That, that, okay, we, we don't have to dispute that, but as the court is aware, res judicata absolutely applies to those in prison. And she is absolutely in privity with the trust. There's just no doubt, even if we, everything she says is true where the trust allegedly conveyed the property to her via quick claim paint, quick claim deed, whatever. Even if that's all taken as true, that's fine. She's in privity and she can't get away from res judicata. There's just no way around that, Your Honor. And this is, for my client, this is the second or I think the third time this is happening now with Ms. Tobin and pursuant to my client's counter motion under EBCR 7.601 uh, at B1 and or 3, uh, we respectfully request reimbursement of attorney's fees and costs in the amount of $3,165, Your Honor. There's just no basis whatsoever for this complaint to have been filed. And again, uh, EBCR 7.60, it's a different standard than Rule 11. We don't have to send a uh, state harbor letter or whatnot. It's as long as the other side has an opportunity to be heard, which they have, and by the way, she did not at all oppose the counter motion. It's suicide motion. So, respectfully, uh, Red Rock's motion to dismiss that my client's showing them must be granted because this is absolutely rest judicata and the request for reimbursement of my client's fees and costs related to this complaint. Thank you, Your Honor. Else that's joined in the motion like to speak? Your Honor, I would just add, this is Hardy Wood on behalf of the Chessies and their lender, Quicken Loans. Um, I just add one thing, Your Honor. In the Harris case, it was a little more complicated as to whether or not there was privity there because you were dealing with a negligence case. In a property case, privity is not a difficult concept. Uh, Nana Tobin, in her capacity as a trustee, signs a quick claim deed, transferring the property to um, herself as an individual. And in real property, that's a textbook example of privity. Um, and I would also add that the type of deed that she chose to transfer the property is telling as well. There are no statutory warranties that accompany a quick claim deed. It's simply a matter of any, any interest that the trust had 
would be transferred to Tobin as an individual. And the court already determined that the trust had no interest in the property. So she's bound by that, both by claim preclusion, issue preclusion, and the type of deed itself that transfers, that purports to transfer the property, because there was nothing to transfer, Your Honor. And the trustees have also filed a request for their attorney's fees as well, Your Honor. How much is that? It's closer to $7,500, Your Honor. And the reason for that, my clients were not involved in the underlying litigation. So there was quite a bit of review that went into looking what happened in the prior litigation before filing our motion. And we also did prepare the request for judicial notice as part of our motion, Your Honor. Okay. And let's talk with Mr. Thompson. Good morning, Your Honor. John Thompson. We can't paint this motion in broad strokes as they've done. There are details that matter here. First of all, issue and claim preclusion, they don't apply if the party hasn't had a full and fair opportunity to litigate. That's in the Thompson case that I've cited. Ms. Tobin thought she was a party. The other parties thought she was a party, and they treated her like a party. They filed documents, and even a motion was heard on April 7, 2017. The HOA filed a motion to dismiss Tobin as an individual, which was denied. Two years later, it was finally put in an order on the eve of trial on 9-20-2019. So we have this situation where everyone thinks she's a party. They think her rights are being litigated. It is true that the trust transferred its interest in the property to Nona Tobin on March 28, 2017, and that none of the parties brought her in as an individual. Now, whether they thought she was, I think that was correct. I think they thought she was. But then at the eve of trial, she's put out of the litigation, and now you can't say that she had a full and fair opportunity to litigate. Her rights have never been adjudicated. The appellate court said that she was not a party in the underlying litigation, and so you have a catch-22. Oh, we don't have to hear her arguments. They're all rogue documents. She filed these motions for summary judgment as an individual. She filed these motions for a new trial. All of these things don't have to be heard because she's not a party. And then when she brings an action to enforce those very same rights against different parties, Red Rock, for example, was not a party in the prior suit. Joel Stokes was not a party. The Kessies were not a party. Quicken Loans was not a party. So this transfer from the trust to her as an individual has never been adjudicated, and it goes directly to the First Amendment complaint that's been filed here. You can't say on the one hand she's not a party, we're not going to listen to her, we're not going to argue, we're not even going to name her as a party, even though the whole world was on notice on March 28, 2017, when she received this interest from the trust as an individual. No one thought to bring her in or to verify so that it would be res judicata, so it would be claim preclusion. In addition, there's a very substantial issue. In 2014, when this sale took place, there's a substantial amount of money, tens of thousands, $68,000, I believe, that were excess proceeds. Now, the statute's very clear that those excess proceeds should go, A, either to the trust, if they think that the trust is the proper party, or if Red Rock thinks that Nona Tobin is because of the March 28, 2017 detransfer from the trust, and the excess proceeds go there. There was even representation, Your Honor, that the funds had been interplayed, and to this date, we still don't have those funds, nor do we know where they are. Now, in the briefing, it says, the Red Rock's party says that, oh, well, the proper place is to interplay. Well, it's been five years. Okay, that's not proper. 
And so just on that issue alone, um, you know, the, the money was not transferred, and we believe that, that was wrongfully done, not done. That omission makes this amended uh, complaint also valid. So different parties, no full and fair opportunity to litigate as an individual in the prior suit, um, and different facts. There's different uh, things that happened. This March 28th deed was never addressed in the other case. He tried to do it. So, Your Honor, we're to enforce your rights. That's why we filed this complaint, and um, and and here we are. Okay, uh, Mr. White. Yeah, I mean, we just need to go over a little bit how wrong that was in in reference to like what happened in the last case. I, I mean. Mr. Thompson talked as though, you know, Tobin just never had a day in court. Like, there was this transfer of the property that occurred on March 28th, and poor Nina Tobin was never able to try for claims. And that's not what happened. What happened was that Tobin brought her claims as a trustee. She went through an entire trial where she asserted that the trust owned the property. She was the party there. She was, the, she was the one behind the wheel arguing. And it wasn't until she lost a summary judgment, it wasn't until she lost a trial, it wasn't until her attorney um, withdrew from the case, at least had an oral uh, motion to withdraw granted, that she turned around and said, oh, guess what? It wasn't the trust that owned the property. Uh, it was me individually. There was a transfer of the deed in March, which, by the way, that could not occur because she had no deed on the trust. The, the property had been foreclosed on. That occurred in March 28th, during the middle of all this litigation. And so now we have to turn around and redo all of this. And that she does not have the opportunity to do that. Um, she, Mr. Thompson argued that she didn't have her day in court because, you know, we didn't allow her in that last trial. But that's not anybody's fault but hers. She was involved in that other action because she chose not to intervene. She chose to pursue her claims as the trustee, not as herself individually. That was her choice. And when she chose to go through the trial as the trustee, not as an individual, she is now precluded under claim preclusion, under judicial estoppel, under a number of doctrines, from now turning around and saying, oh, no, it wasn't that, it was me individually, let's do this all again. She can't do that. She can't have two days in court. She can't bring Red Rock or the HOA to court twice to retry these claims and, and, and see if the foreclosure was improper or not, because a court has already held it was proper after summary judgment at the trial. Um, in regards to the excess proceeds, Your Honor, the only reason Red Rock has not interplay those excess proceeds is because Ms. Tobin keeps challenging the foreclosure sale and Red Rock is not going to interplead any excess funds if there's a chance the foreclosure sale can be overturned. So when Mr. Thompson says, oh, it's been five years and the and proceeds have not been interplayed, it's been five years because Ms. Tobin keeps challenging the process. As soon as, as, soon as we have final word that the process was proper, Red Rock will interplead those funds. Red Rock claims no interest in those funds. Um, it wants to get those funds off its hands as soon as possible, but it needs to do it in a legally permissible way. Um, and that that way is not through an unjust enrichment claim against Red Rock, because there are other parties that may have an interest in all or a portion of those proceeds that we need to we need to um, divest ourselves of those proceeds in the proper manner, which is an interpleader action. And with that, I rest. Okay, uh, Mr. Hong, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, Your Honor, I would. Uh, again, I, I, I apologize for everyone being repetitive, but uh, I, I laugh a little bit because, again, there's no purpose of a case that represents res judicata than this case, Your Honor. But, in terms of counsel for Ms. Tobin arguing uh, not to make it a fair day in court, I, I just, I don't even understand that argument because there was summary judgment in favor of the HOA, and then my client went through a full-blown trial with the trust. And the 
core issue as stated in our moving papers, Ms. Tobin cannot get any relief from my client nor the current owners nor Quicken Loans unless the HOA sale is voided. That's the only way that can happen. And you can only void the sale by saying the same arguments that were raised in front of Judge Kishner at the time of the summary judgment and the trial, by the way, which are both being appealed by the trust as we speak. So that case is on appeal, and yet Ms. Tobin filed this frivolous secondary action identical. And counsel, one of the Tobin say something about an interpreter. I just looked up the amended complaint, Your Honor. There's not one iota reference of interpreting funds. So this whole thing about, well, she should get funds, well, great. It's not even pledged. It's not even pledged in the amended complaint. So this whole argument trying to sidestep the issue is just not going to work. Your Honor, again, respectfully, my client absolutely is entitled to attorney's fees and costs related to this third attempt now to adjudicate the very same issues that were adjudicated in front of Judge Kishner. And it's $3,165 pursuant to my declaration that was attached that outlined the hours actually expended and the anticipated, which is this hearing today. Okay. Mr. Wood, you have some rebuttal time. Just briefly, Your Honor. There has been no explanation as to how Ms. Tobin is not in privity with the trust. It's defined in the Harris case as this. To be in privity, the person must have acquired an interest in the subject matter affected by the judgment through one of the parties as by inheritance, succession, or purchase. And the Harris case also cites the restatement second of judgments, section 41, subsection 1, which specifically states that a beneficiary of the trust, which Ms. Tobin is, is bound by a judgment in which the trustee participated in the action. Ms. Tobin participated in the prior action as a trustee of the trust and as a beneficiary of the trust. She is bound by that judgment. There's just been no explanation as to how that's not met in this case, Your Honor. The second thing that I would point out, and we brought this up in our reply brief, Your Honor, is think about what they're asking this court to do in this case. I don't know how many quiet title cases you have involving NRS Chapter 116 foreclosures, but I know that the district court was inundated with them. And what they're asking this court to do is to allow parties who participated in that litigation, whether it went to summary judgment or trial, to just quit claiming their interest to some other entity or if they had an entity to themselves for no consideration, and then to retry the entire case. Can you imagine what that would do to the courts if that were allowed? That is what claim preclusion and issue preclusion don't allow. There's a public policy reason for that, Your Honor. And then the last thing that I would address, my clients have no interest in the excess funds, but I would just suggest that the suggestion that Ms. Tobin has a claim to those is unrealistic because at the time the property was sold, there's no question Ms. Tobin's own testimony said at trial, again, she testified at trial, confirmed that she was in default not just on one loan but on two loans at the time. So any excess proceeds would go to those lenders, not Ms. Tobin. All right, counsel, I've reviewed everything, and I even scrolled through the prior case. By the way, it would be very helpful to have full captions on these so we could follow the parties, but in any event, Judge Kishner apparently didn't require that. I do in my court. But in any event, Mr. Thompson, it appears to me that Ms. Tobin is looking for a do-over, and she had her opportunity as the trustee. She also, it looks like, participated individually in the prior case as well, and it went to trial. It was a 
four-year case. It's on appeal now. So I think she needs to conclude whatever she needs to do in that other case. But I think she's had her day in court. So I am granting Red Rock Financial Services motion to dismiss. And I will look at the issues relating to the attorney's fees. I'm going to do that under advisement. Okay? So, Mr. White, will you go ahead and prepare the order? Yeah, I'll prepare the order and circulate it. All right. That'd be perfect. And I'd like you all to review it to make sure that you approve it as a form of content. Not that you necessarily agree with me, Mr. Thompson, but that you at least agree that that was what happened at the court here. All right? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you.